Uh, today, I, I, wanna, I just want to bring, I think it's going to be good news, not in a generic sense, but hopefully in a, in a really specific way for you, um, because I think, I think that a lot of us, maybe it's just me, you can tell me later, it's just me, but I think a lot of us have really felt kind of like failures in the last year, and uh, and not because you know of our own doing necessarily, but because of everything we we try and and work on uh, has has just not gone super well, right? Like I was talking to Nancy and Joe over here, and they had plans to to fly out and see family and celebrate a birthday, and uh, and it. It ended up being a failure because Nancy came down with a cold. Same with our Christmas plans, and we've seen so much of that in church, and I'm sure that many of you have seen that in your workplaces, in your homes. Uh, There's just been, I think, this overall feeling of failure. In a large part, it's not your fault. Just letting you know, it's not your fault, Uh, but, uh, but we still feel it anyway. And, and if it isn't just this year, maybe some of you, you, you felt like failures you know, other times in life, maybe your whole life, you felt like a failure. And there's this, this verse, not the verse I'm going to preach on today, but this verse that we're going to build towards in this entire series called Conquerors, and it's Romans 8.37. The, the entirety of Romans 8, that right now we're in chapter 6 of Romans together, but Romans 8 is awesome. I've been looking forward to preaching Romans 8, you know, since we started this series. Some of the other things are difficult. Romans 8 is so awesome, and, and one of the, the culminating verses of Romans 8, verse 37, says, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. This, this word, more than conquerors, is only here. It's a single word. It's only used here. And it's like Paul sees that being a conqueror is not enough. And so he adds to the beginning of the word to make it you know, bigger and better. We are more than conquerors. It, it is a word that is intensified, an intensified word for conquer or victory. And it can also be translated, and this works so well for me who loves competing and loves winning. Uh, it can mean to have victory beyond measure, to not be a failure, to be a victor instead of a failure. The, the Net Bible says, that this, says it this way, we have complete victory can also be defined like this, we are winning a most glorious victory. Uh, This last week, (laughs) because I I worked a little less, I I, I was going through my jerseys, my old sports jerseys, and uh, I may have told you this in a sermon before, but my grandma, my dad's here, he's not responsible for this, but my grandma basically kept every single thing from every part of my childhood, even into adulthood as I went off to college. And so when they make the Chad Harms Museum someday, uh, it is, it is going to be full. It's going to have to just be a giant museum because of all of the stuff that I have laying around. If you ever want to know uh, what I got on like, you know, my second spelling test of the third grade, I'll go find it for you. I have it. Um, and so I, I have everything. And one of the things I have is just, just these jerseys, like these jerseys and these shirts uh, like we're talking like over 50 from, from different sports teams through the years. And so I was going through them. I, I'm thinking about getting rid of them. I was going to get rid of them, but then I posted something about it online and people started to talk about how awesome it was I had them. So I'm, I'm hesitating, but I was taking pictures of them because I'm going to make a poster out of them. That's kind of my goal. And, and I, I got this red Kaiser Youth Basketball Association jersey out and it instantly it reminded me of, of this, this one single game. And my dad already knows what game I'm, I'm talking about probably. Uh, but I, I took my picture of it and I immediately sent the picture, a couple of pictures of these jerseys, to, to two teammates that I played with. Uh, but the red Kaiser Youth Basketball Association jersey, they were not on my team. They were on the other team. And that's why I sent them the picture of this jersey because Ryan and Brian, if you're watching, I'm so happy to tell this story. Ryan and Brian, they, I mean, Ryan was like seven feet tall in the third grade and, and Brian was like a man when we were, you know, fifth graders, like played point guard. If that means anything to you, but he was like pushing six foot, very good athlete. They're both good athletes. And they were on the same Team. Now, we played tournament teams together, but in our little local association, somehow by cheating or stacking or recruiting, they ended up on the same team in this league, and they were undefeated until 
the very last game of the year. And in my head, I, I don't know how many people were actually at this gym, but we were playing this tiny little gym in Jervis, Oregon. I don't know why we were even playing there to begin with, but it was, it was, seemed packed. And we were all friends because we played together on these tournament teams. And, and so we all knew each other's families, but we sure, the families didn't act like it during this game. And, and I mean, we were playing and people were screaming and it is intense. And, and I mean, the game went like this. Brian and Ryan would come in and then they would take a big lead. And then, and then me and a, and a kid named Yasser on our team, uh, another good athlete, we would just pick on their backup point guard and then we would take the lead. And then Brian and Ryan would come in, lead, 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 lead to the point where, where Brian's sister, this is one of my, I didn't tell him this the other day, but one of my great memories is his sister screaming in the stand, so angry that we were picking on their backup point guard like, like we were doing the worst thing in the world. And we won that game. And so that green team, they finished 11-1 and one that year. And, and I still remember it because of how good it felt to conquer something, to be victorious over something that really it felt like was completely stacked against us. And so I was happy to send Brian and Ryan a text the other day. I said, hey, you remember this one? It was like our, our fifth grade tournament team jersey. And I said, you should remember this red jersey because you were on the losing end. And, and you know what? Them being on the other side of it, they had they remembered it like it was yesterday too for all the other reasons. But being victorious, especially over things, this is where I'm going to transition, especially over things that seem like they're unconquerable, like they're too difficult to overcome or have victory over, is really a powerful idea. And Paul, at the end of kind of this three chapters, six, seven, and eight of the book of Romans, he, he gets to the end of kind of this section in Romans, and then he'll flip gears from there, but at the end of it, he just like describes it in, in the way that we've already read. We are we are more than conquerors. We are exceedingly victorious through, through the love of God in Jesus Christ. And so what we're going to see over the next six weeks is basically the reasons that Paul makes this incredible declaration. Paul is going to say in Romans 6 and 7 and 8, he's going to say, here are some things that you have conquered if you have placed your faith in Jesus. Here are some things that you have victory over if you have placed your faith in Jesus. And this is where it starts in, in Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Now, if you were paying attention to my big introduction there, you're like, like that, that introduction did not fit that verse right there. But you have to remember what Paul has just said, and then we'll see where Paul is going. In Romans 5.20, which I preached on a couple of weeks ago, he said, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. And so, logically, right, Paul hears this question, whether people are actually asking it or not. Paul hears this question that's going to be asked, like, wait a minute. If God's grace increases as sin increases, then why don't I just keep sinning so that God can look better, he can be glorified more, he can be seen as the gracious and loving God that he is. Now, before I move and answer that question, I'll let Paul answer that question. I just want to say that that in chapter seven, we're gonna talk about sin a lot and, and sin keeps coming up. And you know, starting in, verse, in chapter five and moving all the way through chapter eight, it's, it's a lot about sin. Chapter six, seven, and eight, a lot about sin because he's talking about what we've conquered and sin is a big part of that. But, but for now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend some time defining sin, talking about the Old Testament and how it viewed sin and the New Testament and how it talks about sin in kind of a, a variety of ways. But for now, let me just give you a definition. In a moral act, considered to be a transgression against divine law. An immoral act considered to be a transgression against divine law. And so these people's question is, can I just transgress, break God's law, if it means that he is seen as or demonstrates more grace because of my sin? I won't tell you what Paul's gonna say. You can probably guess, but I again wanna pause here and talk about Paul's answer, he, he, he sets this question. We don't even know if anybody's even asking this question, right? But we do know that Paul uses this question as a springboard to talk about what it means to be both victorious in Christ, but what it means to grow in our relationship with God once we have become 
victorious. There's these two really important words in theological circles and, and, and they need to be hashed out here because Paul has spent most, uh, almost all of the book of Romans talking about this word, justification. We've talked about righteousness and justification, which is to be declared innocent or to be declared righteous. And so Paul has talked about this and now he moves into at least a little bit another big idea and that is sanctification. One is that, uh, this is so interesting in the Christian world, right? One is to be say, said, is to say that we have been made holy and the other is to say, justification is to say that we've been made holy and sanctification is to say that we then, we then become holy. And so in the Christian life, there are two truths. God, through the death and resurrection of Jesus, has offered us salvation, and that salvation comes as God, as uh, through the blood of Jesus we just sang about, we are declared righteous by placing our faith in him. We are declared holy, set apart. But we all know, every one of us knows, that even after that happens, we bring into this new relationship with God Lots of our own struggles and sins. And so the Bible shows us that while we have been made holy, we must strive to become holy. We must strive to grow and to move away from sin and to add virtue like things like we see the fruit of the Spirit or the divine nature in Second Peter. We must grow even though we have been declared righteous, we must grow in our righteousness. And, and we, must, we must remember both of these things as Christians, that yes, if we have placed our faith in Jesus, if you have placed your faith in Jesus, then you have been justified, you've been declared righteous. But then, as an extension of that, it is our, it is our job, it is our calling to grow in that righteousness. So have that in your minds because Paul's like, here's this question. Should we sin more because grace increases where there's more sin? And Paul is going to use that as a springboard to begin to talk about sanctification and transition away from justification. But there's one more important point here before we look at his answer. He never separates the two. He never goes, oh, you're just totally justified by God, but then you just work and you do all of this, you know, the effort and it's all about you once, once you are in the Christian faith. The whole thing is centered on the work that Jesus has done. Whether we are being justified or sanctified, it is through the power and the work of Jesus on the cross, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And you'll see that, you may not see it if you're not looking for it, but you'll see that in the way that he begins to talk about sanctification in this passage and here's what verse 2 says answering his big question by no means it's like no with an exclamation point no we are those who have died to sin how can we live in it any longer he says no you that's the simple answer should if you were wondering if you came here today wondering should i just sin more so that god's grace is poured out more the answer from paul in the bible by the power of the holy spirit is is no, you should not do that. And, and the reason he gives up front is that because we are dead to sin or we have died to sin. And that just like, as I'm you know preaching through Romans right now, to me that just came out of nowhere. Like that's a phrase I'm familiar with from my studies and so most of the time as I'm you know just reading Romans, I don't even stop to think about it. But this time it was like, as we move through the book of Romans, there's no background there, right? We haven't touched on that. We haven't talked about that. And so the question, you know, that we have to ask is what does it mean to be dead to sin? What is Paul talking about when he says that? Now, one thing that is just so clear is because we know death, right? We understand death. We, we hate death. Well, one thing is really clear when Paul says this. Paul is saying something about the finality of our separation from sin when he says dead. Because we know that death is a, is a final thing, right? It's final. It's, it ends something. It ends the life here on earth. And, and so he is saying something about the finality of our separation for sin. Put that in your heads because here Paul is going to hash it out more. And he starts... I say this so often as I go through Romans, but he starts kind of in a weird place. But here's what he says in verses three and four. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. 
In order to show us what he means by being dead to sin, Paul actually starts with, with what is really an illustration, and that is the illustration of baptism. Now, when you read it, he just he doesn't say conversion and baptism. He just jumps right straight into baptism. And, and one might wonder why, and I think that's an important question. I think that there's something that is really important to understand two things that are really important to understand. The first is that Paul assumes that Christians are baptized. Uh, the question, like for Paul, if he heard that somebody wasn't baptized that called themselves a Christian, would be like, well, "What in the world? Like, how do we find some water?" It's just what Christians do; they get baptized, and so that's one thing you have to keep in your mind. Paul is, is for him; it's you become a Christian and you get baptized. And in fact, the early church, the second thing you need to understand, they actually saw faith, baptism, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the coming of the Holy Spirit into a person's life as really one singular event. Now, that doesn't mean they happened in all one second or one millisecond or whatever, but they saw them as one event in a person's life that would be conversion, conversion into Christianity and, and conversion into the church. And so they see uh, faith, Becoming a Christian, coming into faith, accepting Jesus as your Savior, and then baptism and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as a singular event in a person's life that we could refer to as conversion. And so Paul, when he brings up baptism here, there's no separation here between baptism and conversion and even the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so it's easy for him to say, hey, look, don't you know that you who are baptized, because in, in his mind and in his world and in the church at the time, he's saying, don't you know that when you were converted you you and then the things that follow that we'll talk about in just a second now i would just stop and say you need to pay attention to that if you're if you haven't been baptized if you're a christian that hasn't been baptized well you need to be baptized we don't know when we're going to do that again but uh but man if you want to get baptized you just let us know creekside.me it was mentioned in the announcements go there let us know that you want to be baptized because we believe like paul that this is just part of being a christian you become a christian and you get baptized but when Paul brings it up here, he isn't calling people to be baptized. He's assuming they have. Instead, he's giving us really a double picture in baptism. And he is showing us first this image that we say, that we talk about every time we baptize people. That when we baptize people, they go into the water and then they come back out. And there's symbolism here because it reminds us that Jesus died. He went into the grave. That's what we think about when we dunk people. And then he came back to life. We bring people out of the water. That's the goal anyway, right? And so we put them into the water. We are reminded that Jesus died and we bring them back. We are reminded of Jesus' resurrection. But on top of that, the secondary picture here is really what Paul is talking about. He says that we have died a death like Jesus. And so not only do we remember what Jesus has done, but this is, this is maybe, this is equally important at least. We remember when we're baptized that we now, in some spiritual way, have died with Jesus. Our old lives are gone and we have been resurrected with Jesus as well. We have begun a new life. And that's how verse four ends. He says, we too may have a new life. Paul has been talking about, if you, were, if you saw, listened, watched the last couple of sermons, Paul has been talking about these two spheres in which we can live. You might remember my red paper and my black paper. And we talked about how Christians are in Jesus and non-Christians, people apart from Christ, they are in Adam. And it's better to be in Jesus than in Adam. And here, Paul explains a little more how we become part of Jesus. We, on our conversion, we are we are killed with him and we rise with him we we take part in his death and resurrection which i think is incredible grace right like he suffers it all but then i partake i share in a death like his to use the exact language of romans i share in a death like his and so the old man dies and the new man rises again and we have we have a new life now let's just pause there and say because Paul's going to explain this in verses 5 through 10 even more. It's really important to begin with this idea. I think a lot of us, we look at sin. This is what Paul's getting at. Should I go on sinning? No, we should not keep sinning. But then the follow-up question I think that all of us have, the, the real question that we actually have is, well, how can I stop sinning? 
because it seems so difficult, right? Sin seems like the green team sometimes. Sorry, Brian and Ryan. Sin seems like the green team sometimes. It seems like something that we will never fully have victory over. And Paul starts by saying, here, remember the image of baptism. Remember what's taken place in your conversion, and that is that your old self died with Christ, and you have raised with Christ, and therefore you have a brand new life, a brand new life. And this life is not defined by sin like the old life was. It's one of the reasons that we have become conquerors is that, is this what we're going to see, we have conquered sin through Jesus. And here's how he explains it. He talks about this new life, but then he, he goes into greater detail in the next several verses. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives... He lives to God. Now, the the details of this could be broken down forever, but the overall point is really clear. Jesus died and rose again, and in doing so, he conquered both sin and death. And since Christians, by the grace of God, are, are allowed to share in the death of resurrection of Jesus, we too have been set free from the power of sin and death. That's the good news. Galatians 2.20, Paul describes it differently. He says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It is incredible that we get to share in the salvific work of Jesus. It is incredible that we get to share in his death and resurrection. It's incredible if it didn't benefit us at all, but one of the great benefits is that it allows for us to be set free from sin. We have, because of the work of Jesus, we have conquered sin and death when we place our faith in him. Here's the big idea. I read it already, but I want to draw your attention back to verse 6. For we know, listen to this, listen to this. If you're going to pay attention to anything, listen to this. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Paul uses two incredible phrases, no longer slaves to sin and set free from sin. And the picture that he gives us is that we had a master and the master's name was was sin. He personifies sin and he says, look, you were slaves. You were in slavery to this thing called sin. But then Jesus came, he died and he rose again. He conquered sin. And if you will place your faith in Jesus, then you then you get to share in the death and resurrection of Jesus and you too become a conqueror of sin. You no longer, it no longer has mastery over you. Bob Utley, man, who I didn't know, he's a pastor uh, down in Texas, and I just discovered him this week, and I think I'm, he's an older guy. I don't know if he's even living. It was an old sermon, but, but I'm going to start listening to all of his sermons, and I think it, you'd be, do well to do that too. Uh, he says, death solves all of life's debts. Death, death solves all of life's death, uh, debts. I love that. And, and here is the picture, that when you died, you no longer had the debt of slavery to sin it's like your credit card debt doesn't go with you right and and since you have died with christ an incredibly awesome and amazing gift you now are free from the slavery of sin now let me just i think i learned something this week um I've been watching during this quarantine time this this doctor. I don't remember his name off the top of my head. Doctor something, young guy, real handsome. Uh, he's a doctor, and he he does YouTube videos. And I've been watching all these YouTube videos. Learned that my cold hands actually, uh, my hands are always cold. It's actually a good thing because it means my body sends blood to my vital organs. And if you and I are ever lost in the woods together, I'd live longer. Uh, but I watched this video of him uh, the other day uh, where he interviewed a mortician. And I, it's like so far out of like the norm of his videos, but I was like, 
man, it's kind of weird. I feel like a weirdo watching this right now, but, but I'm going to watch it anyway. And so I was watching this interview that he was doing with this mortician. He doesn't know much about dead bodies. He's trying to keep people alive as a doctor. And he's asking her the questions that you and I would have, some disgusting, some terrifying. But she said this thing that, you know, because I was preaching on this, it really, I thought about it and it, and it made sense to me. And she said she recommends for a variety of reasons that people when they see their loved ones, dead bodies, that they just sit there with it for a little bit. And they don't worry about their reaction. They don't worry about how they're going to feel. They just, they just sit there with it. And, and she gave a couple of reasons for that. But one of the reasons, I think, is because it does, in fact, show us the finality of it. And it helps us begin the grieving process. I think that some of us, some of you, we need to stare our dead corpse in the face, spiritually speaking. We need to come to terms, recognize that when we became Christians, if you became a Christian, when you became Christians, your old self died and that set you free from the slavery of sin. I think we have a tendency to forget the what Paul is exactly trying to get you here to, the finality of the separation from our old selves, and, and specifically in this passage, sin. We, we just, we feel, we think, we act like that old life isn't over yet, like we haven't actually been set free from sin. And so we, we live our new lives, but we cling to so much of the old. And not only do we cling to so much of the old, we act as if the old still has power over us when it no longer does. Now let me pause and say in Romans 7, Paul's gonna talk a whole bunch about how it's really hard not to sin even as a Christian. But before he gets to that, he wants us to absolutely understand that you are no longer a slave to sin. You no longer are held down by sin. It no longer has mastery over you. In fact, you are completely free from it, which means you have the ability to stop sinning even if it seems like the green team, even if it seems like you can't overcome it, you can. You can stop sinning. If there's things in your life that you look at and you feel like it's an addiction or you just feel like you'll never get over it, Paul wants you to just stare at your old dead self for a little bit and recognize that that is gone and you, your new life, your new life has power over sin and you don't have to give in to these things that you used to give into anymore. It doesn't mean that your sin is magically gonna go away, that you'll just all of a sudden become perfect or anything like that. This is sanctification. This is growing in our holiness because we have been declared holy. But it does mean that we need to stop, stop acting like we can't overcome these certain things in our lives that are difficult. Yes, they're difficult, but we can overcome them because we have been set free from sin. I just want to say, I mean, if, you, if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, then just, just think about how with Christ you died. You get to share in his death, and so that old man is gone. It's over, and in this new life, you are a conqueror, and one of the things that you have conquered through the love of God is sin and so you can overcome you can have victory over any any sin that you see in your life i love this uh, in verse 11 listen to verse 11 in the same way this is actually the main point i think the whole passage here in the same way count yourselves dead to sin but alive to god in christ jesus he uses this word count, and we've already seen this word count in the book of Romans already, Romans 4, 5. However, to the one who does not work but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. Here's, here's the big idea. Listen to this. This is what Paul is saying. Should I keep sinning? Well, absolutely not. That's what Paul says, and here's why. When God counts you as innocent from sin, you should count yourself dead to sin. When God declares you innocent from sin, you should declare yourselves dead to sin. 
We should not continue to live in it anymore. See, what we do is we go, well, look, I I share in the death and resurrection of Jesus, and so I can hold on to some of my sins because God is gracious and good. Doesn't God just want me to be happy? But Paul says, when God has counted you innocent from your sin, you need to count yourself dead to it. Dead to it. It no longer has mastery over you. It is not no longer your way of life. It no longer has the power to control you. It should no longer be tolerated by you. You don't need to think, how much can I get away with or how much can I rationalize? You need to count yourself dead to sin because God has counted you innocent from sin. For me, it's always hard to give something up and not add something in its place. I feel like it just gets filled, you know, uh, with the other bad habit or whatever. This is just popping into my head right now. But, uh, you know, in the last several months, I've actually done pretty good at stopping biting my fingernails, uh, which I've done since I was zero, basically. Um, and, and, and so 37 years in and I'm breaking a habit. I feel pretty good about that. But I'm actually, I'm discovering that I'm clenching my teeth all the time now. And so I've just replaced it with something that might actually be worse for me. I'm just like this all the time, not biting my fingernails. That's how I feel most days in 2020 anyway. And so God here, he doesn't leave you just like, hey, count yourself dead to sin, but go do whatever you want. He says, instead, count yourself as alive to God. Your old self is dead and therefore you have conquered sin. But in that conquering, it isn't just like a vacuum. You don't do nothing. You now live to serve God. You live to serve God. Now in this language, we see something that that I think my mom hit on a very long time ago. My mom, at a young age, said this thing to my grandma that's been relayed to me through the years. And, and she was talking about the Christian faith and, and living the Christian faith, living for God. I don't think she used these words, but also trying to live for sin. And my mom made this great point that I think Jesus makes when he's talking about money. He says, you can't serve two masters. But my mom made it overall. And and the imagery she used is stuck with me forever and ever and ever. And she said, trying to live for sin, to live for this dead self over here and for God is like trying to ride two horses. You're just going to fall off eventually. At some point, you're either going to pick one or you're going to fall down. And, and I think my mom's illustration is so perfect for what Paul says here. He says, when you're a Christian, you're supposed to be on a new horse, riding in a new direction, doing a new thing. And you're just going to make a mess of your life if you continue to try to straddle the fence or the horses or to you know, have one foot on one or whatever it might be. And so Paul says here, look, if you've been counted as innocent from sin, then count yourselves dead to it. And begin to live only and fully for the glory of God. Bob Utley, my new favorite preacher, he also said in that sermon I listened to that what's helped him most when it comes to giving up sin is to think of it this this way. When I sin, I break daddy's heart. One of the things we'll see in Romans 8 is that while we were dead to sin, when we share in the death and resurrection of Christ, we are adopted into the family of God and God becomes our heavenly father. And by him, we cry out, Abba, Father, as Paul says. We can look at God and, and cry out, Daddy. And, and here, early on, Bob Utley, I think, makes that connection. He says, you don't just stop sinning. You don't just say, that's dead, and so I'll just give everything up. You stop sinning and, and you do your best to, to bring honor to your heavenly father, to bring glory to your heavenly father. And then Paul gives this really kind of practical application at the end. I think it's the simplest part maybe of the whole passage. He says in verses 12 through 14, therefore, do not let, let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness, for sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. He says, hey, every part of you, kind of two aims, you can ride one horse or the other. And he says, every part of you should be living for this new life. Every part of you should be living for God and no part of you, no part of you, whether your hands and feet or your brain or your passions, none of it, absolutely none of it should be living for this thing over here that is dead because you shared in Christ if 
you are a Christian. And, and so Paul at the end, I mean, it's just so simple, right? I mean, we, we I think it's, I think, I think this is what, what he, is valuable to us this morning. We act as though sin still has mastery over us. And we're like, oh, I just wish I could stop. And I think, I think it's our own way of rationalizing the sin in our lives. We say things like, well, I'm only human, but we're not only human. We're a brand new creation in Christ that no longer is enslaved to sin. And so now in this new life, basically what Paul gets at in the final three verses is you just make a choice. Am I going to do this thing that is sinful or am I going to do my best to serve God? Am I going to use my hands for sin or am I going to use my hands for God's glory? Am I going to, am I going to think things that are sinful or am I going to do my best to think things that are, are pleasing to the God I serve? Am I going to say things that are sinful and hurtful to people or am I going to say things that bring honor and glory to God? He says, look, you're no longer enslaved to sin. And so now in your new life, it's really just you by the power of God making decisions on what you're going to do in a moment by moment basis. I want you to leave here today understanding two things that are big. First, you can't break free from sin on your own. I talk to those of you mainly who are out there inside the camera. If you're not a Christian, you need to become a Christian for so many reasons. But one of them is because you are not dead to sin. Sin is still your master. You'll never break free from it. And so I would hope that you would place your faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus so that you can share in the death and resurrection of Jesus and be set free and brought into a new life, a much better life that allows for you to break free from the things that I know you want to break free from already anyway. As Christians, we believe the same. We can't overcome sin by our own power. It's, that's not what Paul is getting at here, but he is saying you have been set free from sin, and so therefore now you don't have to act like you're enslaved to it, like, oh, I would not do this, but I, you know, I've done it so long, or you know, it's just such a strong temptation, or uh, look at what the world's telling me to do, or my friends all do it. We say, no, 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 I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. And now the question is, am I going to live today for the glory of God, or am I going to live for this old, dead dead, disgusting self that used to be my life. We need to make a decision. If you're not a Christian, you need to make a decision to become a Christian. But if you are a Christian, you need to just say, look, I'm gonna do my best not to sin because I believe that I am, have died with Jesus and risen again with Jesus by his incredible grace. Since we are now innocent from sin, we should do our best to live as people who are innocent, right? I mean, can you imagine? This is, this is uh, just about my final thought, but I, I thought about this. Can you imagine somebody who has spent their entire life in prison for a bank robbery, right? And, and then all of a sudden, they are set free, and then, and then they just go out and they just do it again, <laughs> Like, can you imagine how stupid that would seem to us? Like, what an idiot. He had another thing coming. He was finally free, right? Well, we are finally free. We are conquerors over sin through Christ. And so no way should we continue to accept sin in our lives. We should recognize that we are separated and it's final. And we should do our best to live as innocent people because God has declared us innocent.